Hello, and welcome to Meeting People Where They Are, Reassessing Program Needs and Collection Access Points. And we have three speakers today. We have Rachel Busser, Kristen Newby, and Natalie Fritz. So Rachel, uh, Rachel Busser, local history librarian, has been a member of the Special Collections Department at Dayton Metro Library since November 2018. She has a Master of Arts in History from Wright State University and a Master of Library and Information Science from Wayne State University. She is a member of the Academic Academy of Certified Archivists and was recertified in July 2019. Bussert was previously employed as the Congressional Papers Archivist at the University of uh, Hawaii at Manoa and has also been employed in archivist positions at Michigan Technical University and Northern Michigan University. Natalie Fritz is the Archivist and Outreach Director for the Clark County Historical Society in Springfield. She received a BA in History from Kent State University and an MA in Public History from Wright State University. She is a member of the SOA Advocacy and Outreach Committee and a trustee at large for the Ohio Local History Alliance. Natalie manages the research library and archives at the Historical Society's Heritage Center and handles collections, outreach, and promotion through local and social media outlets and in-person and virtual programming and exhibits. Kristen Newby is a special collections manager in local history and genealogy at Columbus Metropolitan Library. She received her BA in history and classics from The Ohio State University and an MA in history of art and archeology span from New York University. Early in her career, Kristen held many positions in the Digital Services Department at the Ohio History Connection. In her current role, Kristen oversees the genealogy collection, develops public programs, and conducts research for customers and internal stakeholders. And let's um, welcome our first speaker, speaker Rachel. All right. I was hoping not to have to hold this, but I guess I am. Um, I do have. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I am using my timer because I have um, difficulty keeping track of time. It's that time blindness thing. So you will hear a ding and it will be my turn to be done. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to talk about something that I have been, um, I want to say working on, but putting together and experiencing since coming back from lockdown. Um, uh, of course, from COVID-19 closures at the Metro Library. Forward. Okay. So this um this I, I guess journey. It started um when Gate Metro Library started to return to work to on-site programming. Um it was very um it came in different ways when things are reopened. Um so um, I'm going to talk about that, following patron interests, um, the type of workshops that I developed for skill building, interactive experiences, and to know when to let things die. Okay, so uh, Dayton Metro Library, while it was open through much of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, we started a phase reopening of library rooms and services in 2021. And this is, we're reaching the quarter four. So like October, November. Um, and there were some changes to what were allowed as programming and my role at the time. So um, there was a point when the library is doing a lot of virtual children's programming and the adults uh, the the librarians who served adults um, were like, well, when can we do virtual programming? They're like, we don't know, but we really need to wipe off tables. 
Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, there was a point when virtual adult programming was finally permitted. We finally got to do it. Um, the library started allowing on-site computer classes and more children's programming was offered on-site. And during this period, the my predecessor um, actually decided that now was the time to retire and I don't blame her. Um, and then I ended up moving to her role as a local history librarian, which has system-wide responsibilities and one of which is including programming to, uh, to our patrons throughout the entire system. Um, so I was like, okay, how do I do this? Um, so I don't know if you've ever done adult programming before, but it's not like easy in the first place to get people to come to it. <laughs> yep. So yeah. So when I started thinking about ideas of what I can do to have people come back into the library for programs, um, and I want to point out that I'm doing virtual programs at this time. Most of the programs that I talk about today started out as virtual programs and still have an option of being virtual, which, yeah. So um, what I wanted to do is kind of like draw inspiration from a lot of the reference questions and patron interactions that I had working at the Dayton Room Reference Desk. And one thing that I get a lot of, uh, especially in my previous role as the archivist, um, I got a lot of preservation questions from patrons, and I would sometimes get them from um, like historical societies and other organizations too. I'm um, like, so I thought, you know, I think I need to do some programming on this. Um, another question, um, you will know this if you work in local history. Can you tell me if anyone has died or if anything bad has ever happened in my house? Yeah, yeah. yeah we know. We know what that is. Uh, another question, am I allowed to come in here into our reading room and, and do research? They want it. Can we come in here or just look around? Am I allowed to touch this? Um, and also, I wanted to draw in some folks, um, well, just in general, who use our general collections, but I wanted to find things from our general collections that could inspire um, different types of programming so we could kind of move those, merge some interests together, um, things that people enjoy already. They just don't know they enjoy archives yet. Okay, so my skill building workshops that I developed. Um, so I have a personal pre preservation uh, program that I do called Wait, Don't Laminate. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's when I started with, and then I started doing um, an introduction to community archives. That was a workshop. Um, and then I also had one on digital preservation. And then I have a research-based program called Paranormal Research and Local History Collections. That's my most attended program. So, some considerations for my preservation workshops was to um, give people accessible solutions to, I'm talking about like Aunt Cindy, you know, she comes in and she wants to, she's got a, she has an entire box full of like photographs in, in those envelopes, you know, we used to get when we were processed. Um, so realistic solutions that people can use at their home um, keeping and things in mind, like the, the cost of items. Um, I let people know where they can get them. Like, what are some basic enclosures that they should have? What should they know about handling? Um, digital preservation, um, it's complex. So what can I tell you about like preferred file types and backing up your files and transferring those files um, and how to preserve social media? Um, so yes, this is my setup. I, I, I have a, a table of handouts and supplies and other things 
for for people to come and look at at a certain point in the program. And I kind of point some things out and show what type of material you would use this um, for. Um, and again, realistic solutions, especially with environmental control, because Aunt Sandy is not going to get an HVAC system in her house. Um, it's talking about things like having stable, what's the most environmentally stable spot in your room where you can put things? Um, and these have been great. I get a lot of questions about things I've never thought of before, but now I will think of them. Um, and something that I found is that this has led to um, a, a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultations afterwards. So let me move on here. Okay, so this, of course, is my paranormal research and local history collections. Um, a guide to helping you find out if anyone has ever died in your house or if anything bad has ever happened in your house and other totally normal reference questions. And this is um, what this really is at the heart of it is, yes, we're trying to find the name of the ghost in your house, but it's an introduction to our local history resources, what to expect when you're visiting an archive. Um, we go over all the ways you can access our newspapers and other free resources where you can find them. Uh, property research, we talk about that. We're in Dayton, of course we're gonna talk about UFO researcher resources. Um, like, uh, do you know that you can um, access um, the Project Blue Book files on the full three database? I do, I read them. Um, so if you don't, does anybody not know that Wright Pat is like the real Area 51. Okay, so, and then of course resources too for urban legends and folklore. Um, this has been my most well attended program ever. <laughs> um, I'm not surprised, it has the perfect conversion, especially um, in October when it's American Archives Month to you have the, the, you know, research skills and archives and spooky season. And honestly, I could do this most times in the year and have um, a good amount of attendance. So I say that programming math is um, expect to half the people who register to attend. More than half always attend the register. And, and um, yeah, that's been great. And um, so this is one that's been really successful. It's taking a really approachable subject and introducing our collection material um, to people who would not maybe feel comfortable in doing that before. Okay, so another thing that I started planning are interactive experiences. And I started doing um, this sort of thing internally first. So we had the vault tours. Um, I call it vault, we don't go in our clothes stacks. So I, I curated a selection of materials from our collection, from rare and our manuscript collections. Um, and I like to do it as a theme so we can kind of discuss things together um, through uh, relatable content. Like the, in last summer, um, I don't know if you're aware of the Horror Writers Association Summer Scares Reading Program. Well, it's a really good avenue to do local history programming if you look at their website. So I found items in our collection that related to um, books that were featured for adult titles um, that particular year. And it's great because um, this is really like, I'd say it's ages about like, nine and up maybe. It depends on the kid, of course. Um, but uh, I did have a teen at this event who was very into our, um, some of our fairy tale books in Rare. Um, and the other thing that I planned are our Victorian Christmas ghost stories. And I will go into more of that later, actually, right now. So this is one I just tried out. It's my first program that I've ever had like a wait list for, uh, which is amazing. Um, 
So the what I do is I get to dress like a Victorian person, which is why I'm doing this. No. Um, so we give some background on the tradition of Victorian Christmas stories and other kind of things that happened at that time at those parties and celebrations. Um, I did, I do a reading of like the Ballad of Christmas Ghosts. We played a parlor game, parlor games. We played the laughing game. It was very popular um, at the, you know, in Victorian times at Christmas parties. We did not play Snapdragons. That would be unsafe. Um, and then we did a group reading of a popular Christmas ghost story. And I will say, uh, of course, it was volunteer. I would have done it all by myself if I had to, but I did have some volunteers and some people who just wanted to be listeners. Um, I did I did tell the story and show um, several newspaper articles that discuss the Miamisburg woman in white, or um, she's also known as the um, Library Park Ghost. And then I had a rare book display, like some of our... Dickens books and, and other related things um, for people to kind of look at and explore after the program. So moving on to um, special collections vault tours again. So I started doing these um, during our staff day um, program that we do once a year at Eight Metro Library. Most popular session, two years in a row, we're not doing that day because of budget reasons this year. Um, otherwise, I'd do it again. Um, so I thought, well, people really seem to be interested in this session. I really want to do this for our public, for the patrons. Um, again, I think it has a multi-age appeal. Um, small groups. Um, I set the registration to 15 participants. And I think that gives people more space to look at the material and also, of course, for security reasons. And I don't think we want like to manage like any more than that, like looking at the material. I have a pre-event email or a phone call, depending on how people want to be contacted. Oh, that's my reminder. I'm already over. Um, so tell you, um, again, remind you where we're meeting and that you please stop by one of our restrooms and wash your hands before coming in. Um, and before we begin, I do have instructions on how to handle the material so that um, people, people will, of course, handle them correctly, but feel um, less timid about doing it, um, feeling empowered to interact with them. Um, I go around, I talk to, I talk about the, the items featured on the tour, and then we end with some one-on-one -on -one time with the items people can look at, um, whatever they're most interested in. So this is how you get 10-year-olds to want to go to your program. Um, so this is, I did do a special collections era's vault tour in April. I did not know she was putting out a new album. Um, so yes, I developed a vault tour with based on the themes and aesthetics from Taylor Swift, uh, different eras. My boss was like, we don't have anything about Taylor Swift. I'm like, we have lots of things that relate to her. You see our copy of the illustrated rhyme of the ancient mariner. Um, so yes, um, which is referenced in her song, The Lakes in folklore. Um, so, and then I have the Mildred Laws collection, which I arranged and curated by, by era. Um, Mildred Laws was a commercial illustrator who worked for Reich and Elder Bierman. She started when she was like 15. And I need to wrap this up. Um, so this was a person starting very young in their career. She was not trained and she did not have models. She did not use models when she was uh, making her illustrations. So this is what would be in the newspaper before um, they had photographs of models. They would be drawn like this. And then, uh, of course, Taylor Swift being a cat lady, we have our, our um, Estelle Kyle photograph collection. 
it, it has an entire box full almost entirely of cat photos, photographs of cats from the, the, the late 19th century um, and some dogs. And um, this is really great. Um, just to zoom in on this dog, I did have a 12 year old, a 12 year old, a 10 year old attend this program. And um, she told me that this dog looks like her dog. She also asked why Taylor Swift wasn't there. <laughs> I said, I don't actually know her and she's very busy. That's why uh, she's a red ring body. She said that she's out. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I don't know her. Um, but the other thing that I thought was really interesting is she kept asking if the people that these documents and photographs were about were, they're like, are they still alive? Or like, no, are they? No. Actually, a lot of people are going to be dead in, in the content we're looking at, but that's a good time to explain, you know, why we save uh, the things that we save because we're telling stories about people. And this is very well attended, um, these programs, very well received. Here are some things quickly, um, RIP, my great ideas. I have kind of come to the inclusion that people are not so interested, at least maybe in coming in person to history lectures. I had this weird Dayton um, program where I would tell stories, weird stories of Dayton about like the the image over there is from the Dayton Journal Herald Sky Edition. Um, and then we had this pulp romance book club, which, oh, now you can't be part of it. Um, so it was a romance book club where we would discuss a pulp romance from the Janet Louise Roberts collection and um, talk about like the history of the genre in the books. And that we would have, and everybody would have read a modern book. Very low attendance to none on these. And finally, I was like, I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, so those are things I decided to stop doing. Um, so what's sticking around um, are skill-based programs. Um, interactive experiences are still um, going to be happening. I think the next... Um, the next fall tour is going to center around our natural history collections. Um, I'm going to have or continue to have conversations with branch managers and staff, which, by the way, I do a lot of my programs at our branches. Um, and they do very, very well branches. I'm going to continue to host uh, programs virtually. Um, and then I'm going to collaborate with other library specialists, such as our LGBTQ specialists, to um, provide programming centered to the groups that they serve, such as community scanning days. And maybe I'll have many ball tours at branches too. So that's where I'm at and over time. Um, thank you. Hello. I'll get started with uh, just giving a little bit of background on uh, where I'm from, uh, the Clark County Historical Society, and we have a, a staff now. We're up to uh, eight full-time and uh, two part-time staff members um, plus interns. Uh, so when I first started, we were about five staff members, and I was one of three in the, the collections department. And I didn't really have any experience in programming or uh, outreach or anything like that. I wasn't really never considered myself a real archivist. I just um, got tasked to manage the archives from the start of my job. So uh, I kind of branched into doing some programming starting around uh, 2015, inspired by, by pro programming that you guys were doing where you were going into classrooms. I knew I couldn't do that uh, necessarily. So I tested our programs on kids um, for our Saturday, um, our, during our farmer's market, we did uh, short programs. And then the only other experience I had in programming was a crazy wizard themed program that we took on in 2018 um, that we got to try to tie into local history. So when we went into 2020, uh, we were working from home. Uh, 
I was really the only staff member that had any sort of remote access. I had sort of remote access, but I also uh, had been running our social media outlets for the past um, over a decade or more. So I had always been sharing a lot of our digital content on there because I've always, um, as a small staff with not really any money to do anything or, or, or do a lot of digitization, I shared everything that we had online. So when I was stuck at home in 2020, I looked at what have we used in the past? So uh, I wanted to figure out, I, I knew from sharing on our social media, I would always reshare on the group sites where people seem to be a lot more interactive and talkative as opposed to interacting with maybe your business page. That's the experience that we had had. So I know kind of had a, a good idea of the kinds of topics that would get people commenting forever. So I thought, well, maybe I could look at some of the stuff that I've posted in the past and figure out how to make connections using these people's memories because we know people like to talk about this stuff. Is there any sort of programming we could do? So after, how do I advance? Just there. Okay. So uh, something that I always kept in mind is that uh, we all have, there may be a shared history, but it doesn't mean we have a shared memory. So I wanted these any programming we did to kind of get people to share their specific memories and all of our, these were virtual programs that we would be recording. So we know that like sitting down and doing kind of a oral history interview with a whole bunch of people round table, we could get people to jump in and, and share these stories and have this recorded for the future. Uh, so I decided but starting off easy-ish with things that I knew that we had. So I kind of have this broken down into categories. Um, I have enough going on already in 2020. I was home with two kids that in, uh, fifth and second grade. Um, so, and also still trying to do regular content online while we were at home. So after I had a couple of um, dragged staff members into Zoom meetings who had never done Zoom and dragged our volunteers into Zoom meetings who had never done Zoom, I thought, well, maybe we can do something on Zoom. So I know a lot of you were doing virtual, but that was how I started into actual programming of being able to share the archives because I didn't really have that sort of experience uh, doing programming or being able to share our content that way. So I started with one of the easiest ones was a downtown walking tour where I just showed different pictures of, and we walked around the block and we talked about things um, that we could see. And uh, this came from a, a feature that I already did for our paper. Um, every Thursday I send a picture of the then, the photographer goes and takes the now and they run that. Uh, and I had done in-person programs for the senior center and other places for that. But since I wasn't the programming person for our historical society, I hadn't really done any of that for us. Uh, so this would seem kind of like a good no-brainer one to start with um, and became some of our popular virtual programs that we did. And a good way for people to uh, tell, share their stories. And I would always start out with, I'm not a time traveler. I have none of these memories myself. I'm not even from here. <laughs> so you guys tell me what you know about this building, what you remember about uh, these things. Uh, another one that seemed like a good one to start with, because I'm a trivia buff, um, my husband and I collect uh, gift cards every Monday at the, the different places in town that you can do trivia at. So I said, well, I know I like we like Jeopardy, and I know they have um, free Jeopardy uh, templates out there. So these were, um, we partnered with some uh, local schools and organizations to do the Black History Trivia and have a, a program with some of the local schools. We've done general ones during back to school. Um, we, this gave us a chance to showcase some of our collections that we had been able to be digitized through grants. So uh, this was a uh, Ohio Local History Alliance grant that allows us to digitize all of our films. And we decided to showcase them all through a virtual program and kind of really show people how they could search through them, uh, how they were time stamped, how they could better understand how to find things that they uh, could have in there. Uh, another way um, I hope to showcase collection in the future is a virtual program with another uh, grant that we recently got from Ola, we digitized the Springfield Post, which, a, which was a um, one year only, as far as we can tell, um, black owned newspaper uh, that we had gotten from our public library because they could no longer store it. We got it into our collection and decided this was something we needed to digitize. So I hope to go through Ohio memory to show people, here's the kinds of stuff that you can find in this great paper that we now have accessible. Uh, and that's a program that I have planned later this year. Uh, behind the scenes has always been popular in person. We figured out if we hooked up a GoPro camera, we could carry people up to the clock tower, which you can't go up there normally. Uh, we only have one staff member that will do it. Uh, so uh, she took, a, took up there and we could, we could show them some more behind the scenes things that we couldn't even normally show them in person. Uh, 
some other things that we did uh, during going into 2020. One, as we were starting to kind of do more stuff in person and be back uh, with uh, volunteers and other people was, um, we tried to do more oral history interviews that we turned into virtual programs. So we talked to Mr. Walter Stitt, who I believe is 99 now, uh, about his uh, experience as a tank, tank crew gunner. And then we previewed that, but we premiered that as a virtual program with him doing a Q&A afterwards. Uh, another, uh, we have a popular uh, Rikes and Wrens, we're, we're both in Springfield as well. Um, and Wrens, uh, we had several people that had worked there at the windows in the 30s and 40s that were still around, some of our volunteers. Uh, and they sat down and did interviews and then we did a virtual program to share the interviews with people. So that kind of also introduced people to our oral history collections to show them what kind of stuff we had. Uh, I looked back at past programs that we had done before my time in person where uh, the manager of the nitrate film vault at the uh, Library of Congress, George uh, Williman, is from Springfield. And we sometimes call on him when we find something that smells whiffy. It says, can you think this is something we can say film-wise? We've now transferred those. Uh, but he had done a virtual, he had done in-person programs with us. And I called him up and said, hey, can you do anything that you can share from um, Library of Congress? So we did a couple of um, Edison film um, things with him. And those have been some of our most popular ones on YouTube. We know that those show up a lot in searches and that people know we have that, uh, had that connection with him. Uh, that pop up there too, yeah. Um, we've done some partnership programs in person and virtual. Uh, we always have the Amateur Radio Association that started meeting in 2021 in our building. So we did partnership programming with them to uh, not only have them help us tell the story of amateur radio and ham radio and do demonstrations with um, families and kids at our farmer's market. Um, but they also did a very, to what turned out to be an extremely complicated uh, radio build that we realized that we had bitten off more than we can chew trying to build radios with kids. Uh, but we did it. We did a program with them and are still uh, planning to do some um, more programming with them in the future to train people how to do ham radio. Um, we talk about gaps in the collection that you know we we don't we don't have what hasn't been given to us, but not every population that is in our community feels comfortable sharing or giving their um, their history to us. We knew we had a, a large Jewish population, but not much in our collections to represent that. Uh, so we partnered with uh, one of the local synagogues um, and the rabbi there to help tell the story uh, during one of the programs. I know that uh, Springfield has a large farming history. I do not understand much about farming or how it works. Uh, so we partner with local farmers to come explain some of our stuff, how it works through virtual programs. And we also had one do an in-person program where he walked people through stuff that we had in the, um, the exhibits to better explain in person how those things would work. Um, the funerary industry is another big uh, Springfield industry. So um, a little bit more of a morbid topic, but we partnered with a local funeral home to talk more about uh, that industry uh, and with local firefighters was a very popular program to have um, talk about fire, firefighting history. Uh, this was the crazy program that I, we started in 2018, my favorite thing ever. Um, but we were able to bring it back in 2020 thanks to the the grants, the, one of the city uh, grants that they were getting to help um, recovery from COVID, and that helped us to partner with most of the city to have stuff all throughout. Um, at our public library next door to us and a lot of different buildings so we could expand that program um, through and have more partnerships that we couldn't uh, normally have done on our own. Another partnership that's been going on for the last two years or so, uh, our registrar started this. Um, we have a poster over at the public library. So the one, the first and flight one is from the library and they'll set up whatever topic we're doing for that month to showcase what books they have in their collection. And we will have something on our side that will either they have the same poster and then we'll showcase stuff from our, our artifacts or other things from our archives uh, that go along with the different themes. Uh, I looked back to guest speakers to see how they could, or researchers to see how they could become guest speakers. You know, the people that are always writing in to, for research or trying to find stuff. Um, I knew that some of them had books coming out and want to make sure they did book talks. Um, people that were contacting me of information about um, Pearl Harbor history. I said, okay, coming up. Um, with Pearl Harbor coming up, you guys can do an anniversary talk for us. Um, mining those things that we do online, or where we see the conversations online, I know that the, the guy in the bottom, Dick Hatfield, was a local rock star. We knew if we could get him to do a virtual program for us. 
Uh, it would be it would be very well attended. It was our highest one at the time with over 100 people. Um, that's when we realized we accidentally had a cap on who could come in to, to the Zoom and we had to remove it. Um, but it was topped by our mall closing one. Um, we actually held it on the day that our mall closed in 2021. Um, we had over 200 people there, including people that were in the mall parking lot uh, broadcasting to share stuff. Um, and that was a really fun one way for people to share memories and um, get all of that recorded. And I've had people, we had a guy recently contact us who had found that program and said, oh, I heard you mentioned there was pictures. Have you scanned them yet? No, there was thousands of pictures. We have one staff member who, or one volunteer who can do it. We haven't really had time, but we do have an index. And he's like, well, I have, yeah, I'm allowed to take time off work. I'll come in and scan stuff for you. So he came in about two weeks ago, only got through about 200 pictures. He did, he really underestimated how many I said we had, but he got us started on a, a good process for, for continuing that um, because he had found it through the, the virtual program, um, which we put them on YouTube and Facebook afterwards. Um, we know that everybody likes talking about disasters, looking at disaster photos. So the disaster program was hugely popular. We kind of revamp it every year to look at different aspects of local disasters and things like that, floods, fires, train wrecks. Um, the crows like to destroy our building every winter. Uh, so we decided to lean in that. And when we, act, we uh, I didn't mention, we did have an educator, but she retired in 2020 when she realized probably wouldn't been have any programming for a while and she'd been wanting to retire anyway. We didn't get a new educator till the end of 2021. So her first introduction to doing programming was a virtual program to talk about our pros. Um, our former curator did one about quilts for us because we knew that quilts were always very popular. Uh, and then baseball is always popular. I'm actually talking to this guy again next week um, during a sit down interview, but he helped us with a um, baseball program. Um, we've led guided discussions through uh, Net Kettering Foundation, uh, NIFI has guided discussions that you can rent or get the get information. We, we submitted it to people who said they wanted to participate in the discussions. Uh, we do programming around holidays. I've done St. Patrick's Day ones around the county fair. We did trivia and just the fair history. Um, we had a shootout. Um, we had a local police officer who was the local expert on that that came and um, talked about this 1937 uh, incident. Um, and then different things have been going on in the community lately. So I've gone down to one program a month. We used to do two um, because now we're doing in-person stuff as well. But um, they had a cemetery project uh, that I had some of the people who worked on that that shared what happened. And then our anniversary was at the end of March um, of moving into our 134-year-old building. So we had one of the architects of the project had all of these pictures that we had never seen. He let us scan for the archives. Uh, and we use them for this program that he did with us. Uh, we've used it to highlight new exhibits. Uh, some, these are some of the ideas we tested that did not work so well. We always do a peeps in history that we recreate a historic scene in the spring. And we thought that it would be great for a kids program. Um, no one signed up. No one showed up. We tried it twice. We decided maybe we just didn't market that one right. Uh, another way we've tried to test... Um, new programming is through uh, using homeschool groups because we found that since COVID, we haven't really had our regular school groups come back almost at all. Uh, a lot of them are have not really returned, but we've really um, connected more with our homeschool groups at that time and, and kind of tested some things that we would like to do with larger groups with them and, or other programming. Um, they've been our testers, so they did a uh, uh, design city logos and they made their own inventions. And then... Um, one thing that we uh, partnered with the Springfield Museum of Art to do, they we tried to do an oral history weekend um, as part of the, an exhibit that they had up. And uh, we found that it was COVID and uh, the Great Depression stories. And we found that people were not really wanting to necessarily be reported talking about their COVID experiences quite yet. Uh, so we didn't really get a lot of people uh, that participated in that, but we will be showing the exhibit at our museum uh, next month. And we're hoping to do um, some more, uh, figure out some more ways to get people to kind of share and, and record um, some of their experiences. Um, but one thing that I took away from last year's conference that I was glad was if you were able to implement this year was a community scan day with the help of the Ohio History Service Corps and Betsy and all of their uh, great members. They did it for their um, service day. Um, we had, I had been wanting to partner with our local library to get people to bring their collections to us uh, so that in, you know, they could take them back, but they could share their story. So 
Um, with the help of the service corps members, they were able to do that, and we've got some donations out of it. So that's something we're hoping we have the, dig the digital copies that we'll be able to share uh, uh, on a platform. And then we're hoping that we can do more. Now that we know how it works and how it works in our community, we're hoping to do more days like that. Uh, so things that I thought even more about today is um, we get all those things up online, but the transcripts are not edited. Uh, and, and as you know, seeing me stumble through this, it probably doesn't pick, it, they don't, the transcripts don't always pick up what people are saying properly. So obviously we need to edit those. We've only done minor editing on that. So that would be actually a good work from home project that people could do. Um, we have not done great at describing images. Um, and I'm not sure how to do with describing images that are within a presentation when you're, um, so, so I will, I will ask you about that. Uh, and then we need to figure out new access points to get to where we can share this digital content. Like, the stuff we did for the scan day. And that's all I have. And I'll turn it over to Kristen. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll start talking while my slides are on their way. Um, my name is Kristen. I'm with Columbus Metropolitan Library and the Local History and Genealogy Division. Um, when we came back from the pandemic, um, a lot of our programs, just like with everything libraries, we were not seeing typical attendance. Our traditional genealogy programs, traditional local history programs that we had kind of built up a crowd and following for, people just weren't really showing up anymore. And this was for both in-person and virtual programs, all programs where we invited a guest speaker, programs where we were doing original research ourselves on both general and kind of more niche topics within the field. We just weren't getting a lot of attendance. Um, and in addition to that, one of our organizational priorities across the whole library system for 2022-23 was really to think about new ways to get people into the library um, and public programs, especially adult programs, was a way that um, we thought we could get new people into the building. How did I get the arrows to pop up? Oh, sorry. I might have made it worse. I moved it. It doesn't help that my slide is white at the bottom. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of the things that we did specifically in local history and genealogy was think about how we can be more present in our branches. So the local history and genealogy team serves all of the CML system, which, as you can see, includes 22 branches outside of Main Library, which are pretty evenly spread across Franklin County. And even though we serve the whole library system, we previously hadn't really put a lot of time or energy into physically being in the branches or having even good relationships with the branch management teams. So they might have been getting local history and genealogy related reference questions from customers, but might not have been equipped to handle them and didn't feel like they had as much of an open communication network to send them to us, which is of course what we would love for them to do. So, we planned out a branch outreach program. Um, we have five librarians on our team and we divided all of the branches outside of main library among our librarians. So each branch now has a librarian liaison with LHG and they work with them regularly to talk about what kinds of LHG topics are your customers interested in and how can we best support you with the kind of reference work that you're doing. Oh, I moved the mouse. That was a poor choice. There we go. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to go over a couple of the programs that we've been doing in branches. Um, I will also say that Main Library is more of a destination library. It's in the heart of downtown. Um, a lot of people don't have never been to Main Library who are avid CML library card holders. Um, they don't know that we have a parking garage. Older or other folks don't like driving downtown. They don't want to have to struggle for parking if they don't know we have it. They don't like driving at night. People who want to come and visit us at LHG might not have access to transportation to get to Main Library, period. Um, and even our customers who come into Main Library, <laughs> our division in particular is on the third floor. So you could come to the Main Library all the time. And if you never make your way up to the third floor, you don't know that we're there. 
Um, and so part of this initiative was also to just kind of increase awareness that we exist, that we have both an extensive print collection of, li of local history and genealogy books, but also an actively uh, growing archive. Our librarians have done history pop-ups at our branches where they take items from our collection and have a table out on the floor in the public area in a very visible spot for customers. Um, it's a great way for us to get our collections out into the world and have our uh, customers be able to look at them, to ask us questions. It requires very little prep time on the part of our librarians, just a handful of minutes to pick out what you're gonna take with you. Some items are just of general interest. Some things might be related to the neighborhood where the branch is, um, but really we're not doing a lot of prep to be experts on each item. We wanna know what they are, of course, but really this is meant to be a conversation starter with customers, people coming into the branch, see a table full of cool old stuff and they walk up and say, oh, what is this and who are you? And that's an opportunity to talk about LHG, but actually we learn more from customers than they probably learned from us when we go to branches because they're telling us what parts of their neighborhood mean the most to them, what are some of their memories of growing up in the neighborhood, or maybe they're new to the neighborhood and have questions or wanna talk about where they've been before coming to Columbus. Um, and a lot of those conversations have led to those people coming down to main library. They want to loan us something from their own personal archive for us to scan and put on my history. They want to come and start on their genealogy research journey, um, all kinds of things. So it's been um, it's been a pretty successful experience. Um, last summer, we also started doing branch walking tours, which have been wildly successful. Um, the tours start and end at a library branch location, and the people who are doing the tours, who did the tours last year, are two local historians who um, we partnered with us and we paid them to create scripts for five different walking tours. Four of them were branch walking tours where you're talking about the neighborhood, and then we added on a fifth kind of spooky Columbus tour of downtown. Um, these were really great because um, people who live in that neighborhood showed up to tours, but also some people went to all five tours, like they just loved the first one so much that they came, came to them all. Um, we tried to diversify the types of neighborhoods and the type of history that we can talk about within that neighborhood among the, the tour series. Um, our librarian who kind of managed the walking tours, she would work with the local historians to find things in our collection and print them off on big sheets of paper so that they could see the historic building in person, but maybe we have an old photograph of that building from 50 or 100 years ago, and they can look at it in real time while on the tour. Um, another thing that made these really great is that um, because a lot of people who live in those neighborhoods joined us for the tours, um, the local historians who are doing most of the talking are very good about opening it up to questions, and so there's lots of storytelling that happens with customers. And so they, the local historians who have done the research on these neighborhoods, learn things from the people who have lived there their whole lives, or maybe they have a grandparent who lived there, so they come to visit all the time. Um, and so it's been a great opportunity for us to learn about um, the neighborhood history, but also the parts of the history that are more important to them. Like maybe we think that we know what they think is the most important, but actually it's this other thing. We've also been holding branch history days. Um, these on the other hand have been a lot of work, but not in the sense that our librarians are doing the programming. It's almost all exclusively um, community partners or residents of the um, neighborhoods around the particular branch, but corralling the community partners and getting people to respond to emails and commit to a schedule and really actually know what they're doing uh, has been a bit of a challenge, but so far they've all turned out very successfully. <laughs> Um, so part of the um, bit is that we they have partnered with um, other cultural heritage organizations like local historical societies, and they're all very excited to bring things from their collection to these. Um, so these are photographs from the most recent history day, which was at our South High branch. And the photo there in the upper right shows materials from the South High, um, the South High School. And then at the bottom there 
is someone talking about the history of the athletic department at South High School. Um, and then um, we also had someone from um, a local bluegrass group come and talk about the importance of bluegrass as part of uh, the history of the South Side of Columbus. And so these are all people from the community who actually live there um, and they're telling us the things that they think are important that um, other people who live there will also probably think are important. And so that has been helpful and getting people to attend. And also because they have their own communication networks where they advertise their programs and the things they're up to. So anytime wherein they can share part of the load of promoting has um, helped people show up a lot. On our part, um, among Corral and community partners, we also have someone there to help record oral histories and also do scanning. Um, so we just bring our portable flatbed scanner out with us and we have an oral history program um, where folks can just use their personal cell phones and upload it to our digital collection on their own through our My Upload tool. Um, and so we're here to help if they need help, but sometimes people do wanna do like a formal interview oral history, but sometimes they just have kind of a, a quick story that they wanna share. Um, and so that's what you see uh, our librarian Grace doing with the customer at the bottom. And then we also usually include a handful of passive activities where people of all ages can participate like an open-ended question like this one, what's your favorite restaurant in your neighborhood or your favorite restaurant memory? One thing that we've um, done is we get the children's team at that branch to do like a local history themed story time that morning. Um, and an easy thing that uh, we've discovered is that you can convert photographs into coloring pages for free online through lots of different ways. But the one we've been using is Crayola, their website, you can actually do it. Um, and so we will do that to some historic photographs relating to, to the neighborhood or the branch and have those out for kids to do too, which has been really cool. Um, this one is not necessarily more about making the collection more accessible, um, but we have found that Columbus being with the very diversity it is and genealogy being the very Eurocentric made by white people for white people feel that it is, it's been difficult for us to connect with um, people of color on genealogy and youth in particular across the board is not an audience that we have been very successful with reaching out to. Um, so we designed a genealogy program for kids. Um, it's kind of, I like to call sneaky genealogy. They don't know they're learning about genealogy, but they really are. <laughs> um, talking about the family of Miles Morales. Um, and so you know, the second you mentioned Miles, especially with the new Across the Spider-Verse movie, kids get wildly excited. Um, and uh, it makes the field more accessible because um, he's a person of color, he's a kid. He also comes from a mixed race family. Um, and in a, the situation of Miles with having both his biological parents, but also his spider family, um, makes the idea of building a family tree for kids who have very non-traditional families feel more widely accepted. Um, we, one of our librarians recently um, is working with the Central Ohio chapter of the Girl Scouts and she's developing a badge program about family history for them. And like, we realized that our description of the program needed to be more specific because several parents wrote to the Girl Scouts and said like, we're not signing up because my child will feel very uncomfortable making a family tree when they're adopted or live with their grandparents or are a person of color and haven't had the time, haven't been able to trace their family tree back like we would be asking for an activity. Um, and so this was kind of a way to meet them where they are, but also to get them thinking about storytelling and family history and the kinds of things about your family and the family relationships that mean the most to you. And here are just um, some of the examples of the work the kids did. So the end of the um, the end of the Miles program, they we talk about Miles family tree and all of the complicated aspects of it very quickly. But the bulk of the program is that they put themselves in the shoes of Miles as if they were Miles, they create his family tree. And so these are their uh, their versions of Miles's family tree as if they were Miles Morales. 
which are really fun. And I just want to point out that the one on the upper right hand corner, this was drawn by, I don't know, maybe a four or five year old kid. Um, and they were very excited because that's baby Miles on the ground there with his mom. Yeah, but that's so sweet. And that's all I have. So I think all three of us are happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, um, all of you guys have unique and cool perspectives that I really want to steal. So I'm just giving you a heads up. What you can you know, I wish my uh, assistant architect was here because she does all of our outreach. Um, Rachel, I love your paranormal side. That is amazing because we get, I mean, as a county archive, we get people asking if we don't get three to five times a week, hey, can you tell me about my house? I think it's old, it will be because we get that all the time. Because they don't understand that we just don't have these folders of your address and all the stuff of mine. Um, so what how did you come up with that? Like where what was the how did that even come up? Oh, sorry. Okay. I had just been threatening to do this program for a really long time and I was like, I want to do um, a program during spooky season, but I don't want to do like a bunch of ghost stories because people don't really come to lectures, um, adult programs. So, but we constantly get these questions and people kind of walk around like they're afraid. They don't have to tell us anything about why they're looking for something, first of all, but they feel uncomfortable asking these questions and it's, that we are one of the major sources where they would get this information. So we want them to feel comfortable. And I'm like, you know, also this is kind of like, this is my sneaky genealogy and property history um, uh, program that I do. So it kind of melds those together. That, I don't know. Yeah, that's how I thought of it. And my email is may um, be the PowerPoint and share it with Corey. I, like, we, I think we could do something similar that we make it our own. Because we have, we also have our corner template that we could incorporate some of the phobias. I've got lots of random descriptions. Um, but yeah, I, I just love it. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. I know we're right at time, but I have one question from online that um, they ask for any of you. Um, it's kind of a general question about like, what are the expectations for programming? How many you do, and um, how you balance programming with uh, all of your other responsibilities? As I go, I didn't really mention that we are doing in-person programming too, but we didn't start it really start it until this year or last year. We did big programs in person, but we didn't do any of our normal. What we used to do was like lectures or different things like that. Um, we started a speaker series that I only I only have to uh, help support. If we had one yesterday, I just had to be there to help check people in and uh, listen. Um, I liked that a lot um, because I've been doing these um, for since 2020, the middle like May of 2020, twice a year for, through 2021, and then 2022 and 2023 once a year. So. It's difficult to juggle, but I try and line everything up with what I'm already doing. So like if you came in and you asked me to do research on something, I'm probably going to either share about it later online or do a program of it in the future. So we've added something to our like our, our researcher sign in because we're a historical site, not a public library. Uh, I don't know if you guys have researcher sign in, but yeah. So to say, can we can we contact you again? Can we use some of this stuff? Or you? And I sometimes I talk to them about it while they're there to try and line up what I'm already doing to not have so much extra work to keep doing the program. Um, I'll just say that we have, I'm on the system-wide programming committee at Dayton Metro Library, and one of the things that we produce is uh, a programming menu, and it's where uh, the branch staff can um, pick um, presenters uh, to ask to do programming at their branch. So I have my, I have like maybe three or four in uh, a menu and we plan by cycle and we have to plan like six months in advance because of external relations stuff. Um, but I found that in in the menu and I learned very quickly that I had to limit like the amount of programs that I do each month. So I'll say like 
I will only do like maybe four programs in total throughout the system in a certain month. Um, so yeah, I guess that's how I manage it, our programming menu. We also plan our programs out pretty far in advance because our marketing team has certain deadlines to make flyers for us. So we plan in trimesters. So for example, our fall programs, we're gonna um, turn into them at the beginning of June. Um, but in 2022, we were doing a lot of original programs and it just sucked up so much of our time. Um, both like developing the actual PowerPoints and getting all the images you need, but also doing all of the original research too. Um, so one thing that we have embraced is um, any canned presentation, like intro to genealogy or intro to property history, we offer those on demand because anyone on our team could go do it right now and not really have to prep anything because we do all of those things all the time for customers. Um, but anything that we can duplicate it was successful at one branch, then we do it at three or four more. And so each of our librarians does probably four or three programs every trimester. And so over the course of the year, probably hit up every branch that you're assigned to, which is about five branches. So we kind of divide it up that way. But at times of the year, like summer, when things are wild, we probably don't do as much as we might in the fall or the spring. All right, uh, thank you to our lovely presenters. That was really great. Um, and I think we're gonna take a slight break and looks like there's some new snacks out for everybody. And then we'll have another presentation in a little bit.